Okay, now let's go briefly over this final topic of the Turkish branches of the government, the judiciary as an institution. has the following structural scenery where it has a constitutional court added onto the system after 1961 in its pristine form of the Turkish Republican political regime designs starting in 1924, there was no constitutional review specifically assigned as a task to a constitutional court, which was added on in 1961 and preserved in the 1982 constitution. Then there are several courts. They are equal in status to the constitutional court that are assigned the functions of ordinary jurisdiction as Supreme Court of Cassations or Appeals, this is Yargatay in Turkish, Administrative Jurisdiction, Council of State, which was established under that title in the Ottoman Empire in the 1860s as Shurai Devlet, then became Danıştay over time, and therefore it is appropriate to translated as Council of State. It is entrusted with the function of adjudicating on matters of administrative decision making and implementation. Then there is military jurisdiction organized along the same lines <coughs> of a military court of cassation and a military Council of State or Administrative Court. And these two courts serve the same functions for the military personnel of the state. Then there is a court of jurisdictional disputes, Uyushmazlık Mahkemesi in Turkish, which had been established in 1945, but became part of the 1961 constitutional, after the 1961 constitutional and 1982 constitutional developments, part of the system. And that court looks into disputes that come out under the civil as well as criminal court, courts deciding on these just matters of adjudication and develop a dispute which cannot be somehow resolved within the court system, they are referred to the Court of Jurisdictional Disputes, which is the final court of decision. Now, Turkey has come to accept the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights on matters of appeals, and if Any individual has a dispute, conflict, or a breach of his civil liberties or her civil liberties or rights. After the courts of civil law and criminal law or administrative courts and tax courts look into this matter in the civilian realm of life, and appealed at higher levels cannot be solved to the interest of the person who sues the administration or a certain criminal in these courts could then appeal to the European Court of Human Rights and ask the European Court of Human Rights for an indemnity 
against the decisions of these lower level courts. So the last court of appeal, which is not represented in the Turkish judiciary system, is the European Court of, European court of Human Rights, which is part of the Council of Europe, of which Turkey is a full member. So some of you in the past, in the questions asked and the responses given, seem to have confused the European Court with the European Court of Human Rights. Turkey is not under the jurisdiction of the European Court of the European Union because Turkey is not a full member of the European Union, but Turkey accepted the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights because Turkey is a member of Council of Europe. And that court has been looking into many applications and appeals since 1959 in the Turkish case. Now, for the courts of civil law and courts of criminal law, as you can see in the system, there is a certain hierarchy where the individual can apply on courts of civil conflict or criminal conflict to one of these courts. Of course, some criminal conflicts are pursued by the public prosecutor's offices, which are not shown in the system, who, are, who represent the public, as it is called, and they therefore can press charges against a person as in the name of the public. And therefore, especially in criminal cases, even when the individual is not pursuant of remedy of a certain breach of human rights pertaining to that individual, public prosecutor's office can still pursue such an appeal in the name of the public as well. Now, this system, of course, especially the criminal law system, obviously creates some kind of closer cooperation or coordination or the need for closer cooperation and coordination between the public prosecutor's offices and the regular police and gendarmerie in Turkey. The latter is entrusted with establishing law and order <coughs> and helping the judiciary at the rural areas of the country. Urban areas are policed by the Interior Affairs Police Force, basically, which is centrally organized. As we have already mentioned, there is a central organization, and centralism is essential in understanding the Turkish system. There is no local police. There is a municipal authority at the level of a city or a small town where it has its own rules and regulations which are enforced by the municipal police force, which is called Zabıta in Turkish, and does not have the authority of the regular police. Its jurisdiction is confined to matters of commercial activities at the local level, and also matters pertaining to the functions of the office of the mayor or the decisions of the local council, which pertain to the major functions of municipalities, which have to do with standards of living at the local unit over which these municipalities have jurisdiction, which are also enumerated in their laws in detail, which have to do with building permits, 
commercial permits, which provide for certain economic activities to be carried out at that level of the municipality, and many public health issues, from collection of garbage, disposal of sewage, provision of electricity, provision of public utilities, in other words, um, require some kind of effort and cooperation by the municipalities. And if there is anything wrong with the provision of these, or there is some dispute concerning these issues, then the individual can appeal to the municipality and the municipal officers would then regulate these issues and would be involved in some kind of investigation and enforcement of these regulations through their own municipal police service, which is only entrusted with these enforcement of regulations as such, but they don't have the power of authority, power or authority of the regular police force in Turkey. So if there is any issue of any major criminality, then it's the police force that has to look into that, which also includes um, regulation of traffic in most cases. And there needs to be some kind of coordination between the Ministry of Interior's police force and the municipal authorities and their police force in the regulation of, say, traffic and in most matters. And therefore, there are many areas of such cooperation and coordination. And therefore, most municipalities are also put under the jurisdiction of especially accountability and investigation matters to the Ministry of Interior's investigators, Mifetish, who look into the matters that pertain to the performance of the municipality, and they provide the first um, act of accountability before a case is turned over to the court for uh, either civil or criminal investigation any further. Therefore, there needs to be, as you can see, um, a variety of designs that put together local and national authorities in cooperation and coordination to provide for a coherent set of policies to be implemented. And whenever conflicts arise, these conflicts are looked into by these various courts. All administrative matters are usually, if they are not of a criminal nature, referred to the administrative courts. These courts also have tax courts that operate with them, that look into disputes about tax levies and their collection. Now, the judges of these courts, either the administrative or the tax courts, are not all lawyers. In fact, close to about 25% or so are lawyers who have had some legal education at schools of law. A huge majority of them are graduates of public administration programs of universities or political science programs of universities, some from economics, who go into this kind of a career and become a tax lawyer or a tax judge eventually. And these issues um, are of a economic nature for the tax, court, tax courts, and the others are occasionally political and administrative nature, which can be adjudicated by um, judges who have had their education specifically in the matters of public administration with some law courses as well, and also, uh, in this case, public finance and other economic matters, which 
are important in understanding taxes, taxation, and issues pertaining to tax. But of course, this has created over time some debates whether these courts should come also under closer control of lawyers, the legal profession, or not. And there have been many issues pertaining to the decisions made by these courts, um, which were criticized by lawyers, uh, by judges whose legal training are not enough uh, to handle the matter legally under some circumstances. So some issues arise from, from this fact, and they can be basics to understanding the increasing number of appeals made to the district administrative courts and Council of State, and some of them go all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. The major concern in most of these occasions, the very process itself has been argued and also in many decisions of the European Court of Human Rights criticized for being relatively slow. And the amount of time spent in settling a dispute has increased over time and especially during the 2010 referendum on the a reform of the judiciary system became part of that referendum in which it became understandable that on the average about some cases last no less than 1,000 days, which is approximately three and a half to close to four years. That's a very long time for most issues. And that's an average, of course. There are some that lasted for extensively long periods of, of time. There, are, there have been some court cases, especially criminal court cases, which were initiated in the 1980s during the coup and were only settled in 2012 or 2013, after somewhere around 30 years of various appeals, various decisions of the courts going back and forth with no decision that could be finalized through the appeal system in the end. And that has created, again, a considerable amount of um, criticism for the slowness of the system. For justice to be served, it has to be efficient, as you very well know. And there seems as if there is an overall problem with the way the Turkish, especially criminal courts, are operating. They are not necessarily very efficient in handling the matters, and as a result of which, there have been many appeals to the European Court of Human Rights which decided against the Turkish case. Also, the handling of the evidence in many cases, in various especially acts uh, that were carried out against the Turkish state, uh, which had been defined as acts of terrorism, etc., had not necessarily met the internationally accepted standards and principles of law. So under these circumstances, um, there have been, again, many appeals that became very successful, especially when they went all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. Some of the evidence were fabricated. Some evidence were collected illegally, for example, through torture, which cannot be defended in a court of law. And um, there have been also less than effective handling of the investigations. Proper data collection techniques, etc., have improved in the recent times, where criminology, which is a science of um, investigating criminal events, have improved over time. But again, there are many slippages occurring at various levels. 
And there have been many attempts at um, sort of finding a certain evidence to incriminate someone even when that person could not be effectively charged with a certain wrongdoing in many occasions. <coughs> and these cases have created a piling uh, of criticism and the overall performance of rule of law in Turkey seem not to be doing too well, in a sense, which I will show you briefly. There has also been, in the past, establishment of certain special courts looking into matters that pertain to terror. On the side of this, state security courts were established in the 1970s, when Turkey started to experience acts of terror more frequently, although they were inspired by the French experience, these courts were held even after the French disbanded them later on. So the state security courts in the early 2000s were abolished. Then in their place, special courts were established in the 2000s. early 2000s, from the 2000s onwards, until about 2013, if I'm not mistaken, they were also abolished. Both of those courts seem to have operated not exactly within the law very effectively. They were entrusted with enforcing the legislation on prevention of terror most effectively. And there had been many arrests and many definitions of terror, which limited freedom of expression very effectively. In fact, people who had used a certain expression or slogan that coincided with the slogan or the motto or the explanation or sentence uttered by a terror organization was almost automatically considered as propagating terror uh, and became a terrorist and got into the confines of the law on terror and was treated as a terrorist or a potential terrorist under these circumstances. So education free of charge, for example, was voiced by many students at the undergraduate level of the Turkish universities. And this was also used as one of the demands of the PKK, Partiye Kerkeren Kurdistan, and when students wrote these sorts of slogans, which they considered as attractive, they were automatically considered as propagating terror and treated as terrorists. Where, of course, imprisonment became increasingly easy. For the criminal code indicated that for arresting a person and keeping that person incarcerated during the, a trial is necessary when that person is likely to flee and hide or tamper with evidence when left free or could intimidate others. The witnesses, for example, threaten them. So these are measures taken to make sure that terrorists, potential terrorists, those who are charged with terrorism 
or those who are involved in drug trafficking, human trafficking, and other type of mafiosi activities would be easily incarcerated. And of course, it's a decision of a judge to imprison someone during a trial. And in the case of terror, if a certain individual is accused of being a terrorist, the law said that the judge could assume, not has to assume, but could assume that any one of these or all of these conditions were met in that case and keep someone behind bars. So by accusing someone by a public prosecutor's office with terrorism almost immediately created circumstances for incarceration, keeping this person behind bars throughout a trial and not assume their innocence until proven guilty under these circumstances. Now, in certain cases, this can, of course, be understandable. But in most occasions, the judges, trying to avoid any kind of criticism leveled at them, seem to have implemented this clause rather liberally. Whoever was accused by the public prosecutor's office, and there was some evidence indicated that this person was a potential terrorist or looked like one, implemented this clause and put these people behind bars. So in a matter of a few years, the Turkish prisons were flocked by people who had been accused by terrorism and kept in prison while court cases were heard. And some of them, of course, were exonerated from wrongdoing and they were let free to go, but they would have served for 1,000 days on the average during their trials behind the bars and having lost their careers, of course, their names being impl 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 implicated by, by terror, their credibility and credentials were obviously damaged. And this has created a considerable amount of difficulty. Now, it, as these cases show that there are basically two goals that you have to follow in any legal system where the courts play a critical role. As the state purpose, come we are in Turkish. And there are the rights of human beings. Human rights and civil liberties. So the courts are expected to be somewhere in between the two. They have to look after both and reconcile the two. Protect the rights of human beings and the civil liberties of individual citizens, but at the same time, make sure that state purpose is not undermined. For example, if there is an epidemic, MERS or Ebola, for example, state purpose requires that whoever is suspect of that be kept in a hospital and quarantined so that the viral influences that are likely to come out of that person could be minimized, if possible stopped, while that person is cured, if there is a cure. Anyway, chance of contamination could be minimized. If you let that person go, that person will go around sneezing on other people, holding stuff, which you would be touching as well, etc. And then the chances are that you will be 
contracting that disease as well. So in that case, a court could order a quarantine in a whole town, perhaps. Keep everybody in there so that it doesn't become an epidemic that influences the entire nation, the population of a nation state completely. So that is a health-based state purpose. And that requires restricting human rights. You can't argue under those circumstances, I have the right for free travel. You can't stop me from going out of my home, onto the streets and walk over to the grocery store and sneeze my lungs out on the bread. You can't do that. That is not your human right. And court has the right to stop you from doing that. He said, because there is public, a state purpose. There's a health issue. You become a public hazard. So the court can decide on the matter of public hazard under these circumstances. But if the court decides on this issue and respects this overwhelmingly, then the chances are that human rights of the individual and the civil liberties get to be diminished tremendously. And you would find that human rights and civil liberties are not enjoyed widely under those circumstances, and practice becomes highly illiberal under these circumstances. And the main criticism against the Turkish courts have been that they have been very close to state purpose and very close to protecting the state on most occasions, even against individuals, which the state doesn't need, because the state is always more powerful than an individual. You don't need to protect the state against the individual. But an individual is vulnerable, can't exist alone. It was Aristotle, the teacher of us all, who proved it for the first time. He said, in politics, in the first book, beasts and gods can survive alone, he said. Many do live alone. They don't need community. But zoom politikon, as we are, political animals as we are, we can't live alone. The nature is too dangerous for us. We can't survive alone. We need a community of others to survive and to thrive. So under these circumstances, state can exist on the support of individuals. And states are usually very powerful. They have huge resources, human resources, capital resources, military resources, police resources, etc which is always much greater than a single individual. So you can't simply protect the state from an individual. It doesn't necessarily make sense on most occasions. The courts are the most critical institutions established to protect human rights and civil liberties against the encroachments of the state. And are in a position to define the confines of these two realms in a way to enable civil rights and civil liberties be materialized in a sensible sense of the term. And that is a problem which is still continuing and unfolding in Turkey. For that purpose, a host of decisions are made initially at the establishment of a certain constitution, which guarantees that the courts do not come under the influence of the state, other agencies of the state, especially the executive branch of the state. But the Turkish constitution protects the courts not only against the executive branch, but also the legislature. Article 138 of the Turkish constitution states very clearly that on any case that is being handled by a court, 
a member of the Grand National Assembly cannot make any statements, any statements, positive, negative, about the case, let alone criticism, can't say anything on the case, period. This was made because it was assumed that courts needed as much freedom as possible without being perturbed by the deputies of the Grand National Assembly, some of who also serve as prime ministers and ministers in the adjudication of a certain matter. So that they could be independent of such intervention. And the state makes sure that the court does not come under the threat of these dark characters that can emerge from time to time in societies. The mafia of various kinds. These illegal bands of people who are involved in illegal activities for gain, for influence, that they need to be checked and controlled so that they do not influence the courts either. So no one should be in a position to influence the court one way or the other. So under these circumstances, the court would be left by itself to decide on a matter on the basis of law, on the basis of evidence that the court hears. And public prosecutors, especially in criminal law, should be in a position to provide all evidence in favor and against a certain defendant, an accused person at the same time. And the judge should be able to hear both pros and cons about this person. And then on the basis of his own conscience, knowledge of law, applying the norms, principles, and values of the legal system, and the word of the law, pass a judgment on this case. So outside influence, most importantly coming from the executive branch of the government and other potential powerful forces should not matter under these circumstances. Certain guarantees therefore are extended to the judges to make sure that they are insulated against this kind of influence. And these guarantees should provide the judges with enough protection that they can work without any concern for their own lives, the lives of those who, th who they love, their children, their wives, their husbands, spouses, family members, and whatever. So under these circumstances, these individuals would be in a position that if they pass a judgment about a strong person, a powerful political executive, this judge should be in a position not to think that eventually this person will get back at him or her for the decision made by the judge. And there will be no intimidation, no potential threat or fear arising from whoever it is the judge passes a judgment about under these circumstances. And the Constitution in Article 9 argues that the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judiciary, are independent of each other. Therefore, the executive is in no position to dictate any matter to a judge or make any arguments about the judge and should not take any decisions to influence the judge. And the judge is guaranteed 
by law and by the Constitution against such influences for the decision the judge makes. Now, theoretically, all of this is fine. But in practice, it doesn't necessarily work quite this way. The judges are employed by the higher council of judges and prosecutors, which consists of two members. Two of them are not elected. Under secretary of the Ministry of Justice and the minister himself are members of this body. They are the two. The other 20 are either elected or appointed. In Turkish, of course, the term seçilmek may mean selection or election. So the president is involved in selection also, but the term is Cumhurbaşkanı tarafından seçilir. One man's vote. Seçilmek, in that sense, is appointment, not necessarily election. That is a linguistic, should I say, idiosyncrasy that you have to take into perspective, as it is written into the Constitution or into the laws. So these two are non-elected people. Then, by one man, one vote principle, among the first level ordinary judiciary judges or civilian judges and prosecutors, that's the term that Heseka calls it in its own website, so I use it the way they translated it into English, seven judges. Then again, among the administrative judges, first level judges, that means those who have had a relatively long period of career and have become promoted to a higher level uh, than other judges. Three are elected. Then the General Assembly of Supreme Court of Cassation, Yargitay, also elect three from among them. Then Council of State, two. So, Then, General Assembly of Justice Academy, there is a Justice Academy which is involved in on-the-job training. They also elect one person and then four people are elected among academicians and lawyers working in the field of law by the President of the Republic, four people. And those are the 22. Now, this is after the reform of 2013. I don't go through the entire history of this, this council, which is entrusted with various duties, such as hiring, firing, promotion of the judges, and therefore should be in a position to in, ensure that the judiciary works independently. And it's critical who serves on this body. It's assumed that the top two, bottom four, would be partisan appointments. Minister is a member of the government, Council of Ministers, and is usually a deputy of the Grand National Assembly. Under secretary is a bureaucrat who serves with the minister in the way that I explained in the past. And of course, is approved, tolerated, or somehow supported by the government in essence. The other four 
appointed by the president are appointed with a view that these people would be pretty much in line with the president's thinking. So if, if the president is liberal or social democratic, they would be liberal and social democratic. If he's conservative, they'd be conservative as well. Since the current president is no different than the current majority of the Grand National Assembly, these four would be along the same partisan ideological line as the other two. So six people out of 22. The others are elected. <clears throat> so there are 10 of them are elected by direct vote. On a certain day announced by the ministry, elections are held. Approximately 11,000 judges are eligible to vote. Approximately about half of them vote, or a little more. Now, in this case, these elections have created considerable amount of row since 2010 when they were introduced into the system. A, a judge, Orhan Ertekin, Orhan Ghazi Ertekin, wrote a book of, on the sort of transition from 2009 through 2011 around the referendum and these new decisions were made and the design of the council changed as to how these elections took place. He still serves as a judge. He wasn't pressed with any charges. He wasn't declared a terrorist or some kind of a mole in the system or a form, a part of the parallel structure or what have you. He had served as the chairman, one of the two chairmen of the Association of Lawyers at the time, and his argument was that these elections were anything but fair. You have to get the book and read it. It's in Turkish. Those of you can read it in Turkish. Orhan Ghazi Artigan's book. Türkiye'nin yargı meselesi hallolundu is the name of the book. Of course, the term hal in that title, hallolmak, usually means extinguished in the old Ottoman word and referred to siyaseten katl. So he argued that actually the judicial problems of the country or the problems of the judiciary of the country were sort of solved by a sort of a military matter, almost, in a sense, in the most awful manner, that there was a complete destruction of the judiciary under these circumstances. And in, in which he argued that the um, it was obvious who voted for whom. There was no imposition of secrecy on the ballot. It was possible, especially in provinces where there weren't too many first level judges, either ordinary or administrative judges. Therefore, it was very easy when you have three judges voting and you have the result of three voting for the same person, you know who they voted for. The end of secret ballot. Many suggested, and those of us who are more involved with actually election studies, suggested that all judges should be brought into one location, since there are 11,000 of them. We have big sports arenas in Istanbul, Ankara, 
many other parts of the country, brought into, the, into this one arena, and they should vote on this principle, one man, one vote, and in full secrecy. Now this was said, it's very, very expensive. Now we see how money is wasted on buildings, for example, in this country, but cannot be spent for carrying out a proper election of judges. Then they become too expensive. And no other argument was made for it. It wouldn't have been that difficult to hold these people into the capital over the weekend and then send them back. And what is expensive for a decent election? So under these circumstances, they were not necessarily elected by free and fair voting under these circumstances. And they, we went through the same process most recently. Again, the same arguments came out that there was a list of candidates selected by the judiciary fielded by the judiciary, and the judiciary, the bureaucrats of the Minister of Justice established its own list, propagated throughout the bureaucracy the names of these people, and made sure that people got the message so there was considerable amount of intimidation and threat. What would have happened if they had not adopted or voted for these people? So if you read the papers of the last couple of months, from September until October, you will see that there is a lot of debate about how free and fair these elections of these 10 people have been. And these, of course, if you can fix these across the country, it's much easier to fix these in the courts. As a result of which, the higher council of prosecutors and judges have become, again, a highly political, political and politicized body under these circumstances, where you can see a very long shadow of the executive branch of the government, very visibly present. And then the law was, again, reformed after 2013, in early 2014. And it gave the Minister of Justice enormous amount of powers over, this, over the running of this higher council of prosecutors and judges, which even bolstered this image of the executive branch of the government over, the, over this very council, which decides on who gets to be hired, who gets to be promoted, who, goes, who gets to be assigned to a specific court, who gets to be assigned to a specific prosecutor's office. And therefore, the independence of the judiciary is more theoretical than practical under the circumstances. More on it tomorrow. OK, as you recall, we were examining the Higher Council of Prosecutors and Judges. in which there are 22 members, where the Minister of Justice and Under Secretary of the Ministry of Justice are ex officio members, non-elected members. And the Minister of Justice serves as the presiding officer of this council. Then there are four appointments by the President who selects from the list of academicians and lawyers working in the field of law. Then there are 
the rest of the council, 16 members, who are elected by one man, one vote principle among the first level judges by voting procedures that take place across the country where the first level ordinary judges and prosecutors participate. And there are also similar elections taking place in the Supreme Court of Cassations and Council of the State and Academy of Justice or Justice Academy of Turkey General Assembly where these elections take place. Therefore, this body has been constructed so, so that elections can be more representative for earlier, before the referendum, the number of people serving on the board were seven members, including the Minister of Justice, Minister of Justice, who was again the presiding officer as the chair of this high council. But there would be then those who were elected from among the members of the Supreme Court of Cassation and the Council of the State, Conseil d'État of Turkey or Danishtai, and the ex officio status of the undersecretary had also existed from the beginning of the 1982 constitution up until the 2010 referendum. As you can see, these appointments were much more confined to the two major higher courts, Supreme Court of Appeals or Cassation, Yargatay, and also Conseil d'État. And therefore, the referendum and the amendment of the Constitution enabled the body of the this higher council to, to change and expand where these two were preserved. Four new appointments by the president of the country was added on and then the numbers increased of those who are elected from the Supreme Court of Cassation and also Council of State. And then uh, there were also those who were directly elected from among the first level judges. And therefore, this is now the overall distribution. And this distribution continued until the 17th of December 2013 events, which after the reforms were organized into three bureaus. And these three bureaus were assigned to do tasks that differed from each other. And the most critical were the appointments of judges, as we will see that the Higher Educational Council, I'm, I'm sorry, the um, High Council of Judges and Prosecutors are, according to Article 159 of the Constitution, are assigned with the duty to ensure the independence of the courts and security of tenure of judges. They also have 12 substitute members and they are um, jobs or the job definitions were made by 
the Constitution itself. And this article here indicates the changes that occurred on September 12, 2010. These people may be re-elected when their term ends, so they can serve longer periods or longer tenure um, under these circumstances. Now, the basic functions of this body is the admission of judges and public prosecutors of civil and administrative courts into the profession. So they recruit judges and prosecutors, therefore they're very important in deciding who will become the public prosecutors and the judges. Their appointment and transfers to other posts than their original appointment, delegation of temporary powers, promotion and promotion to first category, and decisions concerning those whose continuation in the profession is found to be unsuitable, therefore they can be fired by this higher counsel, judges and the prosecutors, and they can impose disciplinary penalties, and they can remove from office. Ministry of Justice could also propose to abolish a certain court, and the final decision about abolition of a final court, of such a court, is also made here. They can make territorial changes in the jurisdiction of a court, and any other functions assigned to them by constitutional law could expand these powers of the higher council. Only those decisions that have to do with the dismissal of the profession could be appealed to a court of law. The rest are final decisions. So, it is very critical as to who controls this higher council and how. Therefore, there have always been considerable amount of controversy about the appointment of these judges. And more recently, their election. Every election time, there are different lists that are circulated and the press reports about the nature of these lists, various factions or fractions within the judiciary who are close to these people who are placed on a certain list, and it looks as if they were sort of competing political organizations for elections, somewhat like political parties. Of course, fielding of judges by political parties for these elections are not necessarily fair or legal or legitimate for that matter. However, in both occasions, in 2010 and also 2014 elections, the press have been replete with various news and editorials arguing that the Ministry of Justice was very active in establishing a list and proselytizing, campaigning effectively across the prosecutors and judges for the election of these people on the list. And if you go with the reporting of the press, the press also indicates that the ministry has been quite successful in getting their candidates elected. In the 2010 elections, for example, one of the most popular candidates turned out to be the bureaucrat in charge of the Human Resources Bureau of the Ministry of Justice, who handles the files and the personal dossiers of each prosecutor and judge. So under these circumstances, it became very clear that there had been quite a bit of involvement of the executive branch of government in naming these people. 
And these new bodies created within the council also are assigned to different duties. And again, the press is replete with arguments that some of these were created so that there will be a full control of the Minister of Justice in especially firing of some of these people who the government considered to be in opposition to them and were related to the allegations aired on the 17th of December 2013, which implicated that four ministers of the government and the prime minister and their relatives were involved in one of the biggest corruption scandals of the country ever. And through these interventions, it became possible for the government to declare that there was a conspiratorial faction within the prosecutors and the judges of the country, and they were eliminating them from office, which they called a structure within the state, parallel to the state. They called it a parallel structure without any evidence. And at the same time, argued that they would be therefore uh, appointing instead prosecutors and judges who will be independent of this parallel structure and would be serving justice better. Of course, we'll yet to see their performance um, since these appointments and also the renewed um, elections in 2014 of this body, the council, as such. At the same time, <coughs> um, the newly appointed prosecutors have decided that there wasn't enough evidence to press charges against the um, ministers, prime minister, former prime minister, and their family members, so they were accused by some in the press of covering up the corruption charges. In the meantime, the Grand National Assembly, the, those ministers happened to be their deputies, established a commission, an ad hoc commission, which is investigating into these allegations that had been provided to them. And that investigation, since it is within the jurisdiction of the Grand National Assembly, still continues. And we will see where that investigation will lead to eventually. So the current picture, it seems as if, is that there is a lot of political football connected with the council which is entrusted with these functions that I enumerated. Um, by reference to the 159th article of the Constitution of the country. <clears throat> Therefore, much depends on these functions being carried out in the way it is written here at the very beginning of this article. They shall exercise the functions in accordance with the principles of independence of the courts and the security of tenure of judges. And since these are the two constraints on the activities of this higher council, you will hear this debate on their decisions of tenure, removal, promotion, and all the other functions that we talked about here being implemented, whether they are within the confines of these con two constraints or not. And the opposition in the Grand National Assembly and outside of it, and also the media and the press not controlled by the government or those who are close to the government have been arguing that those two constraints have been breached blatantly. And under these circumstances, the judiciary does not seem to be 
operating within the confines of the Constitution assigned to it through this Council. As a result of which, the independence, which is also emphasized in Article 9 of the Constitution, the independence of the courts, is anything but a myth under these circumstances. And that, of course, breaches a, not only a basic principle of the Constitution, but also a basic principle of rule of law and a liberal democracy that exists today. So under these circumstances, a big problem emerges for Turkey to stay within the rule of law and also within a liberal democratic context under these circumstances. And that takes us back to the very list of statistics I had shown you in the beginning. These are reflected, I'm afraid, negatively on the performance of the political system and the judicial system of the country on rule of law. Therefore, Turkey emerges as a case that is highly noticed in the statistical analysis of the decisions made by the European Court of Human Rights as one of the most important and systematic violators of the European Convention of Human Rights under these circumstances. Also, many measures of rule of law um, made by international agencies and various organizations that have been involved in measuring such things as freedom, liberties of World Justice Project, which tries to measure rule of law, or Transparency International, which measures transparency and the performance of the judiciary in managing corruption in the country, seems to indicate that Turkey scores very highly on all of those realms and is not doing too well. And the situation, after having improved slightly up until 2005, has deteriorated from 2005 up until now. And this deterioration has not been cured in spite of the fact that there have been many reforms attempted by the uh, Grand National Assembly and by the political parties and forces of the country, as we have seen. So under these circumstances, it looks as if the consolidation of democracy problem of Turkey is still a major agenda item which has not been successfully dealt with so far. And that stands not only in domestic politics, but international relations of Turkey with the Council of Europe, of which Turkey is a full member, and with the European Union, of which Turkey is an associate member, and negotiating to become a full member. And those are deeply influenced by these um, performances, which seem to indicate that Turkey still has a lot to cover to improve to reach the Copenhagen criteria of which Turkey has officially committed as a state to reach. Yes, sir. Under the circumstances, of course, no. In the foreseeable future, unless things change rapidly in a direction where we can deal with these problems that I have enumerated with the court of laws and the way they operate and the kind of influence they come under from the executive branch of government being dealt with effectively, the answer is going to be no in the foreseeable future. Those are all intended for another purpose, to which I shall turn now, <laughs> which means winning elections. You see, the problem now is that those who are 
incriminated, implicated, and accused of wrongdoing are very popular. People keep electing them. Number one, after the 17th of December 2013, allegations emerged to indicate that the major power wielders had been abusing their powers, which is nothing amazing, because as we know, a fundamental law of politics stated by Lord Acton, which I'm sure you have been instructed by now, Lord Acton is a liberal thinker of the 19th century, early 19th century. He said, he has a law, it says, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. When the Justice and Development Party won the 2011 elections, I was on a television network and we were debating what this meant. That's what I said. You will see a lot of corruption now coming out of Justice and Development Party. Their power has become absolute, and absolute power produces corruption. This is a rule that has no time limits, no geographical limits, no regime limits. Every regime is vulnerable to it. That is why we need to constrain power, limit government, have checks and balances, establish transparency. Otherwise, we'll observe a lot of corruption. That's in the nature of politics. So. What the government was able to do when this news about corruption was unearthed, which was not amazing so far as I'm concerned, I was expecting it anyway since 2011. The only problem in my mind was why, were, why was it so late to appear, you know, in 2013, when it appeared. What the government did was that all of these allegations were a conspiracy. Conspiracy of foreign powers, United States, European Union, Israel, you name it. They got together, they formed a conspiratorial group, which tried to topple the government, which according to the government at the time was illegal and aired all this news. There is not an iota of truth about it. Well, there is actually a watch, for example, which was given as a bribe, which again appeared in yesterday's news, that the tax for it was not paid. It was illegally brought into the country. Then there was a debate whether this was actually purchased by the minister in question, or by someone else. Well, there's a lot of implicating evidence. Since we didn't have a court case, I can't tell for sure, but the implicating evidence indicated that it was purchased by somebody else, given to the minister. And that somebody else is documented going through the customs by the police with the watch. Then watch appearing on the wrist of the minister. So. And that became a matter of investigation. And he was asked to defend himself in the Grand National Assembly. And he came up and defended himself. He said he purchased it. But it seems as if the bill for it did not seem to have his name. And the company in Switzerland argued that they do not inscribe the name of the person who, who purchases the watch on the bill necessarily. So under these circumstances, it has to be properly investigated by a prosecutor's office. But the prosecutor's office says that there's nothing to investigate. 
Lovely. So we don't know. Then it was discovered that the son of the Minister of the Interior had six or seven safes in his house. Now, why would you keep six or seven safes in your house? Unless you're dealing with hoarding cash, dabbling in cash, which is suspicious in this day and age. We either make our payments in plastic or electronically, if they are especially big sums. So it looks as if big amounts of cash has been going in and out of places, carried by shady characters who are tied to a businessman who seem to have been in shady business, who seem to have been caught by the officials of the Turkish customs in 2007, when his company was taking out of the country some drugs stashed in a truck. Then they investigated him and discovered eventually, in two years' time, that he has this very close relationship with the sons of several ministers. Then this person approached the minister of finance and the minister in charge of the economy and tried to bribe them. And these two people, Mr. Shimshek and Mr. Babajan, asked the financial authorities, financial investigators of money laundering, etc., Masak, to look into this matter. They also investigated him and discovered that he has been involved in a lot of interactions with ministers as well as the sons of ministers. And looked as if in many occasions there have been a lot of monetary payment. Then they started to get a court order, as I understand, and listen in to the debates deliberations and conversations between this gentleman and the ministers and their sons, which then were unearthed on the 17th of December. Uh, so far as most in this country would probably accept is that this is something that has to be investigated properly. So no investigation is a basic cover-up. However, it was very successful of the government to argue that this was all a conspiracy. They simply made sure that nothing is aired about the evidence. And they, through various television networks, were able to air that this was a conspiracy of the foreign agents in which this parallel organization, headed by a gentleman who resides in Pennsylvania, who has had a clerical background once upon a time, is the main culprit. And therefore, this idea without any evidence pointing to this gentleman or the organization being involved in anything of the sort, whether these allegations about bribery, the watch, money unearthed in very various locations, some of them found in shoeboxes, some of them in safes, Various conversations, which eventually involved the Prime Minister and his son. You know, all of that was presented as a conspiracy. And this conspiracy was repeated over and over and over again. And large swaths of the people supporting the government seem to have seen this not as a case of corruption, but conspiracy and did not mind voting for this political party into, first of all, local government with 43% of the people voting for them, about 19.8 million votes cast in favor of the Justice and Development Party candidates on the 30th of March 2014 local elections. And then 20.6 million on the 10th of August 2014 presidential elections, which happened for the first time. In essence, this was more or less one to one and a half million or close to two million less than the vote they got in 2011. 
in total sheer numbers. But percentage-wise, it ranged between 43% and 52%, depending on the participation rate. On the 30th of March, it was 89% of the voters voting in the election. On 10th of August, it was only 74% participation rate. Therefore, it dropped, and almost the same amount of votes got the prime minister about 52% of the vote, and he won the election. So, how come people vote the way they do, and how do they vote? I'll start from the end and go towards the beginning in this case. First of all, I would like to bring to your attention that on the basis of what you had covered so far, that you know that Turkish society is deeply divided by several fault lines cultural fault lines that divide society into groups of people who have different contrasting images of good society. The most important of which is the difference between secular versus pious Sunnis. Who take the Sunni approach to Islam very seriously, practice religion very seriously, and they believe that religion is very important and central to their lives versus those who do not take religion very seriously, although they may be Sunnis themselves, do not necessarily show great meticulousness to worship or follow and create a lifestyle based on such an idea of Islam. So the Sunni voters tend to vote for those political parties that look more conservative, who at their crux have traditions, religion, and rural values composed into one hard core, which we have unearthed and published with Ali Çarkoğlu in this book called The Rising Tide of Conservatism in Turkey, as you very well know, versus the others who vote for a secular party. That should be one difference based on identity, religious identity versus secular identity. Secondly, we have another division over eth ethnic nationalism, where there are those who are Kurdish nationalists, who believes that they're ethnically different. And these ethnically different Kurds constitute one segment of the society, homogenous among themselves, and they know who they are, and the rest are by default Turkish. They may be ethnically Turkish, or they feel as if they are Turkish, or they may consider to themselves to be Turkish. It's a definition anyway. So ethnic nationalist Kurds versus the other. The others, one definition. They tend to vote for ethnic Kurdish parties. Non-Kurds tend to prefer either ethnic nationalist Turkish parties or civic nationalist parties, more emphasizing patriotism rather than nationalism based on ethnic basis or even racial basis of any sort. And this division has been 
with the society since the beginning of the 20th century and played a major role at different periods in time. Thirdly, in survey after survey, when we ask the question, what is the most important problem facing you? The answer is unemployment. So we would assume that unemployment should play a major role. Unemployed tend to vote against the government party, as you would expect, and the employed tend to vote or support the parties in government. So whether employed or unemployed, job situation or work experience defines the orientation of the people towards political parties. Fourthly, due to socialization, upbringing, or by accident, people tend to develop a sympathy and eventually some kind of close identification with a political party in due time, which is referred to as party identification. Especially when you have long time serving, well-established institutionalized parties, people tend to develop stronger feelings for these political parties and hang on to them for life. Especially if these kinds of identifications are very strong, psychologically strong, people tend not to care very much how those political parties do, they vote for them irrespective of their performances. They identify with the party, it's like being a fan of a club, soccer club or a basketball club, it doesn't make any difference. If your club fails to do well in the league that year, you don't switch clubs, you still hang on to it. You love the colors and you stay with them for life, whether it's, it does well or poorly. Of course, when it does well, you're happy. When they do poorly, you feel sorrowful, but what can you do? You identify with that club anyway. So this, there's this close connection in between. And when that kind of connection occurs, usually it's because of a certain upbringing in a family. The family members who the individual thinks very highly of, such as father or mother, had identified with a political party, and it's usually handed down by the previous generation to the next generation. In fact, at certain times, in certain places, this kind of conveyor belt socialization is very, very effective. Many years ago, in 1959, Herbert Hyman, a sociologist from Columbia University, had argued that for the United States, in the Midwest of the United States, People are not only born into a family and a church, but they're also born into a political party. Almost at birth, you know that they're going to be Republican or Democrat, depending on which party, which uh, family they're born in and what kind of community they're raised. It's so ironclad, so well determined. No longer in the US, of course, that much has changed, but in Turkey, you can also make this kind of argument for an number of political parties. And the <coughs> allegiance to a party and then eventual identification develops over time. People do not necessarily instruct their children to identify with a political party, but the children get it from cues. They watch you while they're growing up. They see what kind of orientation you have to certain figures that appear on television every night and how they relate to that person. And if a certain behavior is rewarded, it's reinforced. It's a basic psychological tendency in us. And social psychologists argue that much has to do with rewarding and reinforcement in learning. So people learn to love this guy who appears on the screen every night and scolds people because the parents love them also. 
Whenever he comes out, I say, wow, great. Now, hush up, we're going to listen to him. And every time an argument is made, they clap and say, bravo, to the point, go on. And the child learns about this. And the next time they watch the same guy, the child does that. And gets slaughtered by the parents, says, very good. That's the attitude, starts learning. If you do it carefully, you can easily create an identifier very early on in life. In 1984, we conducted a study with a colleague from Uludağ University, Ali Ashar Sarawai, on the elementary school students, 11, 12 year olds. And we discovered that approximately 40% of them not only knew about the political parties, but they had also started to identify with political parties. When we asked them whether they were fans of political parties, about 40% said yes. Could you name the party? Almost all of them said yes and name the party. And we know by fact of research conducted elsewhere also in France, in Norway, in the United States, in Britain, children first learn these political parties, identify with them, or develop an awareness and affiliation with these political parties. Then they develop their political ideologies, eventually. So it's very important in overall orientation as such. But once identification takes place, it makes life easy for the voter. You don't have to listen to anything. Come vote, you see the insignia, the ticket, the sign, you stamp it. You don't have to listen to the campaign, you don't have to spend any time on reading the stuff, you don't have to care for the policies that they suggest, and whether those policies will be good for you or bad for you, whatever. But if you're not identified, then other matters also are important, such as your ideological orientation. If you can somehow identify your position on an ideological spectrum of some sort, and also identify the position of the political parties and their candidates on such a spectrum, then it's relatively easy for you to choose your political party or candidate to vote for, those who are ideologically closest to you. So those who position themselves on such a scale, which we usually present them with a scale that runs from extreme left to extreme right, with an imagined center in between, and we kept asking people whether they could identify themselves on such a scale, and they do. If you don't believe me, I can show them to you. But they identify themselves, and they can also identify the political parties on the scale. And they, therefore, those who identify themselves as being on the left, are likely to vote for political parties on the left. And those who identify themselves on the right are most inclined to vote for political parties on the right. And finally, an economist and a political scientist from the United States, way back before, not your time, but also mine, made these two arguments. In 1957, Anthony Downs argued that people making their decisions about voting look to the future and say, will this people, if they get elected and form the government, do me any good? Do my family or the country any good? If they do, or they think that they do, if that is their perception, then they would vote for this political party or the candidates of that political party in the elections. It is called prospective voting. Prospective. You expect a certain prospect and then vote according to that prospect. In the 60s, a political scientist from Harvard University
Vio Key argues in a in an article and then in a book that voters do not do that. They do just the opposite. They look back. They look at the performance of those in government for the last year or six months or two years or three years, some time frame, and evaluate how they were doing. Was that any good for them, their family, their country, and then make up their mind to continue to support those in government or to switch their votes and support those in opposition? This is called retrospective voting. So prospective, or retrospective, two different voting. Now we, in Turkey, ask in surveys both sets of questions for prospective and retrospective voters. Then we analyze them statistically to produce two different dimensions or two different scales of prospective and retrospective voting, but they do not scale on different dimensions, but on one single scale scale. So I call it economic satisfaction or dissatisfaction hypothesis, which measures economic satisfaction and dissatisfaction, which seems to be that those who retrospectively think that the government is doing a good job tend to think prospectively that it'll continue doing a good job, or vice versa. If those who believe that the government is not doing a very good job or indeed doing a bad job of managing the economy, continue on thinking that they will do so in the future and vote accordingly. Now, we've done surveys from 2009 until 2013, but these correspond to 2009 and 10. 2013 and 14, so this field survey started in 2009 and continued in 2010. This is the way I, I show them here. For the last five years, I have two different constellations here. One that includes party identity, party identification, one that doesn't. I call the second one a sociological model. The first one party identification model, so to speak, or general model of voting behavior. What I do is divide the voters between those who voted or are to vote for Justice and Development Party if we had the elections today versus those who argue that they will not be voting for it if we had the elections today. Those who are to vote, one, others, zero. Then try to predict those results using a regression analysis, logistic regression. So it's called binary logistic regression. And try to estimate or guesstimate what these various variables show in predicting who will vote for Justice and Development Party, and how well? Well, the general model, as I call it, which has party identification, does quite a bit better. It explains more. These are R square. This is the total explanation. Goes up to you know 75% in one case, uh, which is as, as high as you can get with this kind of statistical analysis, and correctly predicts anywhere between 75 to 90% of the time, who is going to vote for Justice and Development Party and who will not in these time frames. 2011 is an election year, so is 2014. But the rest are not. And they indicate that the most important variables are these two, economic satisfaction and party identification. 
But if you take party identification out, economic satisfaction is number one. Those who believe that the government is managing the economy well and continue to do so tend to vote for it. Two is secularism, as I called it. Those who are religious, therefore secularism scores negative, tend to vote for justice and development party. That's the second most important variable, explaining it. Third is ideology, right wing. Fourth is work experience and ethnicity. They are equally important. But amazingly, it is those who have never worked in their lives for pay ever vote for the Justice and Development Party. Not only the unemployed, but unemployable vote for it, which refutes my hypothesis and proves the opposite. And those who are employed tend not to vote for the Justice and Development Party. Now that sounds weird, right? Well, not so. Then I looked into this category, never work for pay. Those who argue that they had never worked for any pay in their life or earn a living in their life. Kazanç karşılığı çalışmak in Turkish. Never work for it. This is the largest voting bloc in Turkey. There is no other group in Turkey that is as large as this group. It's about 50% of the voters, more or less, 45 to 50%. Huge. Of these people, about 80 to 90% are women. That's not a striking a finding because our labor statistics indicate that Women have labor participation rates in the 20 percentages. If you take the recent measures taken in converting some women who are looking after their disabled offsprings at home as working, then the labor participation of women in Turkey is about 28%. Otherwise, anywhere between 22 to 24%. So more than 70% of women have no labor participation in the country. This is not unemployment. They're not looking for jobs. Unemployment occurs when the definition of unemployment is when you look for a job and can't find it, you're unemployed. When you're not looking for a job, you're not considered unemployed. You're not just participating in labor. That is more important so far as voters are concerned for this analysis. So we were expecting that this would be the case. And labor participation rate for men is about 70%, just the opposite in the country. Now, we had asked these people separate questions. One on work experience, what is, the, what is your work now? And you could answer that I work at a certain place, I'm unemployed, I used to work, or I have never worked for pay in my life. The third category, which is anywhere between 40 to 50 percent of the population. Then we also requested these people who participated in these annual surveys to answer this question about social status. We have a scale or a ladder of social status, which starts from lowest to highest, 10 point scale. Where do you place yourself? Now, according to the scale, those who, who have never worked for pay in, when we asked this question first in 2009, 2010, 12% placed them in the lowest rung, okay? Come 2014, almost no one placed themselves in the lowest rung. The survey sample has about 2.5% plus and minus error. So any figure you see here that is less than 2.5% may be considered as zero. This is zero, this is zero. It looked as if these people moved up in life in their own eyes considerably. From about 
21% plus and minus 2.5% error, who categorize themselves between 6 and 10 higher rungs of social status. In 2009 and 10, come 2013, 14, has gone up to about one out of three. A relatively big jump. So it looks as if the unemployed and unemployable have had a huge increase in their own eyes of their social status under the government in the recent years. And they seem to be voting for the government under these circumstances. This is usually done in two ways. Number one, there are various social welfare transfer payments to these groups of people who do not work but receive money because they are looking after their disabled family members or because they are poor or because they qualify for some other reasons and get this kind of payment from some government controlled agency for who they are, not because they work. This has nothing to do with merit. No merit is involved, no toil is invo involved, no labor is involved. They get something for nothing. Lovely, having a cake and eating it too. Free riding, basically. As you would recall, the most important demand of the Turkish electorate from the Grand National Assembly is to free ride. Anyway, so it's met for large swaths of the population who return the favor under these circumstances. Now, of course, this creates a rentier class in Turkey who are supported by the government systematically for who they are without doing anything to earn this kind of income. And they don't pay taxes. So the connection between taxation, accountability, and voting does not seem to be established at all. So the basic foundation of representative government does not seem to exist for this large group of people under these circumstances. Secondly, the government also reaches them as a political party along cultural symbolism and through cultural messages. Religion. Now going back to your question. You thought that the Turkish Prime Minister was talking about prejudices. He was not. Yesterday, he was talking about the image of women in his mind and his political party's mind as mother. Your mothers, we love you, we cherish you. We do everything in our power to uphold you, to let you go up on the scale. Heaven is under the feet of mothers. You stay home. Make five children. Raise them. And we respect you more. That's the message. Don't look for jobs. Don't look for equal treatment in the market with men. Stay home. That's the conservative message he is giving very effectively. And he would like to present himself as the champion of these group of people. And there are enemies. Who are they? Feminists. Beware. There are so few of them anyway. So divide and rule. Mothers versus feminists. We look after the mothers. We care for them. We cherish them. We hold them up. And there are those who wrongfully think that they are equal to man 
and looking for jobs. That's bad. Avoid that. Stay at home. And beware of your enemies, the feminists. Nice message. Pays well in elections. You would think that that is sexism, of course. But it gets votes. How about that? And he embellishes in racism also, very easily. That also gets votes. Very effective in getting votes. From who? From this block that I showed you. 50% of the voters. They overwhelmingly support Justice and Development Party, as opposed to the other political parties. And when you measure their performance on xenophobia, chauvinism, racism, they're very high on that also. It's the values of these people who the government is effectively engaging and exploiting to their benefit. And of course, is giving the impression of being the champion of Islam. Not Muslims in Turkey, Muslims everywhere. He is going to build a mosque in Cuba to show the power, richness of Islam in the heart of atheist Cubans. How about that? That's a very strong message. Very powerful. He is the champion of Muslims everywhere, not in Turkey alone. And he tells them, you know, you have done great things in the past. You were the ones who had discovered America. Then they came up with a conspiratorial explanation of Christoph Colomb, etc., etc. He can write up a story completely. And it doesn't make any sense to argue that his slant is useless, meaningless, this or that. It doesn't matter. He is after projecting himself as the leader of all Muslims in the world, leader of Islamic heritage, promoting that around the globe to an extent that the Saudi Arabians or the Egyptians or the Iraqis or Syrians cannot do. He can do it. He is the leader of all Muslims who looks after the needs of all Muslims, even those who live under the atheist rulers of Cuba. So you have to read the message carefully. Okay? Yes, sir. Can you say that uh, the building of the, the new palace and that image is just uh, that the image you just uh, showed? That is the reason why people may accept the building? Of oh, sure. Now, I'm glad you asked that question. We also asked the people in 2013 application of the ISSP, the data, same data. How clean do you think Turkish politics is? Again, on an 11 point scale. Totally clean, totally dirty. The entire population of voters, average response, okay? Arithmetic average, seven. So voters, on the average, do not assume that Turkish politics is clean. They assume that it's dirty. Those who told us that they would vote for AKP if we had elections that day, they have six. believe that it's slightly more clean, but we have something like 1.5, if I'm not mistaken, standard deviation. So this is not a meaningful difference, so to speak. They're not substantially different from the rest of the people. Now, 
My colleagues who study Russia has come up with a concept. It's a tongue twister. Eudaimonic legitimacy, they call it. Is what we hear from the Justice and Development Party supporters. All politicians are corrupt in Turkey anyway. Number one, this is legitimation, bounded rationality, economists call it. Secondly, what would the opposition do to us if they are ousted from power? There is no opposition. What is the opposition suggesting anyway? All of these are legitimation for supporting the status quo into the future. Which means that things are going barely OK. They're not perhaps brilliant. They're not perhaps great. But they're working anyway. So it's working. Why change it? However, it may be it is better that it is working the way it does currently, which means I'm not hurt enough yet. So I have still credit extended to the government. In spite of that, they are corrupt. In my eyes, you know, everybody seems to be corrupt. A second argument that we have made, and some comparative research supported this. For example, a 2013 electoral studies argument, article argued by Clashlin and Tucker, that when they compared Moldova with Sweden, they discovered that in Sweden, people are highly sensitive and sensitized to corruption. And they won't tolerate any of it. Whereas in Moldova, it's just the opposite. People don't care a bit. The difference is between a comparison of politicians who are competent but dishonest versus politicians who are honest but incompetent. Who would you get? It looks as if in Sweden, honesty is emphasized more. Perhaps it's a left-wing population as well, because we have recent studies indicating that in Britain, conservative voters tend to choose competence over honesty. So if you have more social democrats, honesty gets overemphasized. Whereas more conservative voters do not seem to care so much about honesty, but more competence. We're just barely looking into this now and trying to understand how the logic of the voter works. But it looks as if a very critical factor here is economic welfare. When economic welfare is low, when you don't know whether you're going to eat a meal tomorrow or not, you don't care about honesty of the politician. You look for the politician who's going to fill your wallet. It's your wallet that matters. Because you have no money in your wallet, honest politician is not going to feed you. You need the politician who can bring some kind of benefits to you that you can enjoy and uplift yourself to a higher level of economic welfare. And you don't care whether this is done honestly or dishonestly, through legal or illegal ways, through corruption or not, makes a little difference. Besides, the kind of people I'm talking about who constitute the backbone of supporters 
of the Justice and Development Party in this analysis may be sociologically defined as a lumpen proletariat. And lumpen proletariat is not very high on law-abiding citizenship. They live in the shady gray area between legal and illegal. And they, can, they used to go back and forth very easily. Many of these people live in illegal housing, as had many of those who were elected on the ticket of the Justice and Development Party had. They had illegal jobs. Some members of their families work for companies who do not pay tax, who do not pay for the electricity that they consume. I end up paying for it, for their electricity as well, out of my taxes. They don't. They don't pay Social Security either for these workers. They're paid under the minimum wage. They get less than minimum wage and they have to eke out on that basis. Do you expect these people to uphold the law? Look for honest politicians? That's an outlandish expectation of a naive academic at best. It doesn't work that way. One thing is certain. These politicians and the people who vote for them know each other very well, communicate very well. And these are the people who vote for candidates who look like them, but who had become successful and powerful in life. So they speak the same language, same values, whatever they may be. Sometimes it's religion. Sometimes it's sexism. Sometimes it's racism. Sometimes it's chauvinism. Sometimes it's the fear of foreigners, chauvinism, xenophobia, anything. Whatever works to win the next election would be used. One basic orientation among conservatives in Turkey that we have unearthed in our surveys is that they do not believe in rules. Anomi, as Emil Durkheim called it once upon a time, rulelessness. Anomi. It comes from the root nomos, the term. Nomos means rule in Greek. A nomos or anomi means rulelessness, not acting according to rules. What you sometimes see in Turkish traffic, you know, it's not that hard to imagine for you, you know. People act arbitrarily as they wish. And there is a huge tolerance for that, you know, no problem. In the eyes of many, under these circumstances. Now, this is Justice and Development Party. Main opposition, CHP, you get a completely different picture here. First of all, secularism is important, but look at all those values, positive. What is the percentage of people who are secular in the society, if our surveys are correct? At most, depending on how you define secularism, and much depends on that. At most, 35%. At most, 30% would be a good bet. Of course, some of these who are secular are also opportunists. If they believe that the government is doing a good job, they would continue on voting for the Justice and Development Party, not the opposition secular party. Okay. Ethnicity doesn't explain much, but that's usually Turkish. Ideology, left wing. The values on the right, I got rid of the scale, but the values on the right are higher. Values on the left are lower. It's between 1 and 10. 
So if you have something like six, seven, eight, that's right wing, two, three, four, left. So higher pro proclivity to vote for Republican People's Party goes with lower scores of the left-right spectrum, negative scores. Secular. And economic satisfaction, again, negative. Those who are on the left, who are secular, who are dissatisfied with the way economy is handled, tend to vote for the Republican People's Party. Just the opposite of Justice and Development Party. And the Turks, mostly. Not in the case of the Justice and Development Party. Justice and Development Party is the largest Kurdish party in Turkey. And work experience doesn't explain much. The unemployed don't vote for the Republican People's Party. They don't expect much from them. Those who have never worked in their lives for pay also do not seem to be supporting of them. And these figures are also negative. Those who are employed. Professional white color seem to be supporting them. How many are they? Those above the age of 18, about 9% are university graduates in Turkey, 9%. How about that? Not even 10. So when you come to counting heads, 50% are lumpen proletariat. Something like professional class is somewhere around 15%. Very small comparison to that. They don't count as much. Then you have artisanal employment, etc. Some workers and peasants, less than about 20% of the population now employed in agriculture today. That's the breakdown. So it looks as if Justice and Development Party is at the right place at the right time, whereas the Republican People's Party is at the wrong place at the wrong time. Then the third party I will consider is the Turkish Nationalist, Nationalist Action Party, Ethnic Nationalist Party. It gets overwhelming support, very high coefficients from the Turkish part of the society, but not all, all of them are significant. Therefore, ethnicity does not seem to be explaining much for them either because there's an overwhelming number of Turks in the system, the way we defined it. Approximately 85% are Turkish by this definition, based on language. Secularism doesn't explain anything so far as MHP vote is concerned. Work experience, again, those who are, who are employed tend to be voting for MHP. Party identity, economic satisfaction, ideology. Ideology is also important, but the important thing is that ideology has become less important for the Nationalist Action Party recently. It used to be considered as the most extreme right-wing party on the left-right scale. No longer. In 2014, they're even to the left of Justice and Development Party in the eyes of the voters. Not in my eyes, in the eyes of the voters, who we asked to place the parties on that scale. Justice and Development Party is put to the right of the Nationalist Action Party for the first time ever. And ideology doesn't seem to be influential that much under these circumstances. So economic satisfaction, again, seems to be very important in explaining the vote that goes to the MHB. Those who are economically dissatisfied, again, look at the negative figures here. All these negative figures. Minus 25, minus 69, minus 49, minus 93, minus 79, minus 98, minus 91. As you can see, all of them, of course, zero point. Seem to indicate that those who are economically dissatisfied, who seem to be on the right, do not vote for the Justice and Development Party, but vote for the MHP instead. And those who are employed, who tend to be employed, and they don't seem to be getting as much vote from the bulk of people who have not participated in the labor force 
as such under these circumstances. So this produces a big tendency for the Justice and Development Party to reap the benefits of the situation, get anywhere between 40 to 50 percent of the vote. Supported mainly by those who do not participate in the labor force overwhelmingly. Those who are religious, Sunni pious Muslims, Kurds and Turks, and emerges as the largest Kurdish party in the system. And at the same time, those who think that they're doing a good job of running the economy. In fact, the economy did extremely well under the Justice and Development Party between 2003, when they came to power, they won the election of November 2002. Therefore, they formed the government in December 2002. So you can't simply credit the 2002 performance of the economy to the Justice and Development Party, but from 2003 onwards, you can. So 2003 performance of the Justice and Development Party, of the economy from 2003 until 2008, the economy did relatively well, especially in comparison to what happened in 2001, a major financial meltdown. <clears throat> the booming economy seemed to have helped them coin this image that they can manage the economy well. And that had benefited them considerably. And they are still benefiting from those five years of doing a very good job of managing the economy. And that can have a long-term influence, as far as we can tell, in Turkish politics. For some of you still keep hearing about the 1940s. It's the war economy that really battered the people in the 1940s, which I will look into in two weeks' time, which is still influencing the image of the Republican People's Party, which had been in government then, to the 1940. Mind you that the median voter is about 30 years of age, 30 years. Which means that the median voter was born in 1984, had no inkling about the 1940s, never had been influenced by anything that happened in the 1940s. This median voter means that 50% of the people voting are either born in 1984 or any time after that. Those who can vote at the age of 18, that is those who were born in 1996 and beyond. Those who were born between 1984 and 1996 constitute healthy voting age population, health. I bet these people don't have an an image of Azal or Kenan Evren, for that matter, the most important characters of the 1980s and 90s. They were dead before they were born, politically. In the case of Azal, physically also. He died in 1993. You know, so far as they're concerned, I may be talking about Soliman the Magnificent, what difference does it make, you know? Or Ismet Inunu. These are historical characters. Doesn't make any difference. But we still have references being made to the 1940s, how we suffered in the 1940s, how things were bad in the 1940s under the Republicans' people art, and they seem to be still paying a price for the war economy that they weren't able to manage today. So Justice and Development Party can actually go a long way with this kind of image of their economic performance. Yes, ma'am. Can we just say that the voting behavior depends also on the socialization of the people and tends to belong to the family background? And if the parents were telling their children all the time that it was such a bad time, then that might deeply influence 
children to go. Even their parents don't know anything about 1940s. Their parents are my age. I don't know anything about 1940s. I didn't live then. I heard about it from my parents. You know, vaguely. How much do your parents know about 1940s? Perhaps they were born, you know, after that, I'm, I bet. You know, you don't have the experience of that. You can't say, oh, yes, that's how it was. Somebody's narrating you a story. Maybe about 1940s, or it could be as well as 1940 BC. What difference does it make? Whether it's 1940 AD or BC. It was something in the past. Somebody did something to somebody in the past. What difference would that make? It seemed to be coming around. And this is being you know, narrated as such. And it constitutes a certain image still today under these circumstances. Not very rationally, but it does. So this image may travel a lot perhaps, into the future, as we can tell. The economy is not doing that well today, as some of you may know. Turkish economy is growing anywhere between 2% to 4% today. Not like 8%, 7%, 9% of the time, any longer. That's a very low growth rate, high unemployment, high inflation. Official inflation rate is almost 10% and they're making everything in their power to keep it below double digit. Because that's bad news, double digit inflation. But Turkey has one of the highest inflation rates in the world today. Whether you believe it or not. Look at the back page of The Economist. Every week it announces all of these statistics for 35 countries. Look where Turkey stands. One of the highest in terms of percentage of Foreign trade deficit, one of the highest in terms of inflation rate. Also relatively high unemployment. Anywhere else that would be considered as a bad performance, not in Turkey. Still, the economy is, or economy is doing fine. <laughs> That's the basic impression you get from the people. We have many who believe in eudaimonic legitimacy and using eudaimonic Legitimation. Things are all right. I'm surviving. I'm doing fine. You know, let's not rock the boat. If it sinks, I'll sink also. You know, that kind of mood makes the situation go on as it is and creates support for the political party that is in power in most, in most occasions under these circumstances. So these statistics tend to indicate that we have a certain um, type of voting behavior which is based on not only ideological but also economic rationality and at the same time some of the major divisions in society based on religious orientations and ethnic orientations. And those orientations are not likely to change in a, in a very short period of time. Ideological differences are not likely to be diminished or will change in a very short period of time either. So this has created a particular type of party system in the country which I will look into into next week. This has created a heavily concentrated right-wingers in Turkey. The right now constitutes anywhere between 50 to 55 percent of the population. About 25 to 30 percent are in the middle. The rest, about 20 percent or so, are on the left. So the center is very small. For a very long time, Turkey had a very huge center with about 55% concentrated in the center. And then on both sides, about 22, 23% on the left and the similar side on the, on the right, when you ask people to place themselves on a left-right scale. 
After the Cold War, that has changed. And Turkey moved into a completely different realm now. And it had become a different kind of political system in which um, Justice and Development Party prospered and predominated and still dominates the scene. However, it had not been like this since the very beginning. In the beginning, Turkey had started with a two-party system. The Republican People's Party was established in 1923, Democrats in 1945-46. Uh, also, the Nation Party or Millet Party was established similarly in the 1940s, and they started to perform as part of a multi-party system in 1946. And they had created a two-party system, which was again dominated by the Democrat Party. And it had almost created a predominant party system by 1957, which was overwhelmingly dominated by the Democrat Party votes and seats, as you can see here. But all of this has changed several times to produce the picture that, that I showed you today. How this happened and why is the next topic I'll turn to, but not today, next week. <laughs>